Hey, Aubrey, how are you? You're muted. I am good. How, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well, thanks. Just, do you, uh, when you joined in, do you see the startup screen? Yeah, why? Okay, I just wanted to make sure it's up there. Is that the I one I created or is that a different one? Oh, I I created it. I don't know if, if you've created one and you want to put it up there, I'm more than happy to let you do that. I just noticed that the um it looks a little different. <laughs> I'm sorry, if you've got one. We've updated our we've updated the format a little bit. Oh, okay. Cool. I will stop sharing this one then and uh you can share yours. Thank you. Oh, you've got to give me back. Um, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, I'm certainly not a, a great driver of this program. <laughs> um, if you, if I can't make the meeting ever, you can go into common, um, you know, the iDrive. Uh -huh. Um, under appeals hearing officer, um, I will have created an intro screen and there is a folder for intro screens and you can find it in there. Okay, perfect. So I, I try to create them a little ahead of time. If I know that, um, for sure, we're going to be having them, I create them. Um, as I. Make several at a time. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, what a dummy I am. I appreciate you doing that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I think not everybody's in the know with what us admins do behind the scenes. Well, um, our heads would probably pop if we knew everything you guys do, but we sure appreciate what you do do. You keep us, you keep us going. That's for sure. We try. I end up with so much stuff up, I just don't know where to put it all. I don't know why it is not lame letting Amy in. She's going to try and enter as an attendee. Um, I double checked that she was on the invitation earlier today and yeah. it's 
she didn't get the invite. And I sent another update at like 4 o'clock and she didn't get that either. And it's no. <laughs> I also sent her a link as a panelist. And it won't let her in. It says she's not recognized. So. Uh, this Oh, there she is as an attendee. I can okay. I can move her. Move her in. Yeah. It's not letting me open it. I'm over WebEx. I'm over it. Oh, I hate this program. You did it. Thank you. I did it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank goodness for uh, you offering. I know. I'm glad I just get to be on the back end of this and don't have to figure out everything that you're having to figure out. So thank you. Right. Oh, no problem. It's definitely a challenging program. Hey, Amy. Do you do you know? On our uh, billboard map exhibit, do you know what rogue billboard means? I don't. I've seen that referred to before, but I don't know what it means. Yeah, Sam I wonder just, if Sam I know. knows what it means. Well, she she just um, sent us a chat asking oh. if we knew. I don't. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know, know if, if you saw the email from uh, Joshua Peters Peterman. Yeah, I did. Okay. I'll ask I'll ask Daniel if for some reason he by chance knows. I know I know he has done a lot of the mapping and stuff for the billboards, so maybe he knows what it means. Yeah, I, I mean, my guess is that it's just a board somebody put up without getting any approvals, but I, I don't know. Stephen, this is Aubrey. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you um, to make sure your microphone works. You're unmuted. Stephen? Stephen? Might have walked away.
Hello, Mary. How are you? Good. It looks like I joined it twice. Oh, and I, and, you and are on there twice. <laughs> and I, I, I can hear myself echoing. Am I echoing for you? A little bit, yes. I'm going to sign off and start again. Okay. Great. Thank you. I'm wondering if we're going to run into a problem because she's still signed in, even though her video went away. Yeah, oh, can, we, so can we do that, that one out? I'm trying to figure out if I can. There we go. Am, am I good now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Much good. Better. Yeah, I think, you know, I had like too many links pop up and I didn't realize it. <laughs> So, and Aubrey, I don't know why, but on mine, I the uh, comments, quest, questions and answer thing is disappeared, and I can't seem to get it to pop back up. Yeah, I was actually told to disable those for the meeting. Okay. Um, okay. That's so fine. It shouldn't That's be why then. <laughs> Everything right. should be on record via video. Yes. So. Uh, Mary, just so you know, we've been having a little bit of a problem with web WebEx over the last couple of months, um, muting and unmuting people. So we do a little bit of a um, check before we start the meeting, just to make sure people's microphones work and whatnot. Okay. Um, and I'm I'm going to try that now. Um, Stephen, this is Aubrey. I'm going to unmute you. Can you respond, please? Stephanie Miller. Steven. Oh, Stephen. Okay, great. So Sorry, you're um, presenting for Chrissy's item, correct? Correct. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to step away for a minute, but I'm here. Yeah, I always know for WebEx to sign in early because it's not, I don't use it as much. So just in case there's a problem. Yeah. But I always take for granted that everything will work. So do I need to read a statement about the remote meeting? Or? Um, it's no longer required by law for you to read it. However, it is um, good to have it on, um, you know, for public notification okay. um, every, every 30 days so that they understand um, why we're meeting remotely. Okay. And as this is the first appeals hearing of the of the month, it might be good to read that. Um, okay. However, you won't have to do it next week. It okay. will be posted on on the agenda. So what's the language? Do I? Um, I sent that over to you earlier today. OK, is that the thing I signed? Yes. OK, yeah. I'm going to turn off my video for a second and I'm I think it's upstairs. I'm going to go get it. OK. I'll breathe. Thank you so much for your help. With <laughs> no problem. I have really, it. Really appreciate it. There has been a lot of changes, especially with the legislative um, thing that ended, but the mayor is asking for um, cooperation amongst the boards and whatnot to continue to keep everybody safe and at home.
So, and we have another one next week. This is the first time in a long time that I've had two in a month. Yeah, um, we've been getting a lot of appeals. Well, I like doing them, so I'm always glad, but I know that's not always necessarily a good thing. No, that's, I'm glad you enjoy it. It makes it, makes it easier. <laughs> Aubrey, do you want to check with the uh, attendees to make sure that they can hear us? And that I did check them? with Stephen Miller. He's he's a presenter on Chrissy's item. Okay. Um, it looks like Dewey Reagan is currently away from his computer. It says not paying attention. So, oh no, nope, paying attention now. Dewey, this there is Aubrey. I'm going to unmute you. Make sure you can um, comment. You're unmuted. I, can you guys hear me? Yeah, are you going to be speaking on 1 of the items or commenting on 1 of the items? Uh, possibly the, the 1st 1, I believe okay. it's the 1st 1 on the agenda. Okay, the, the billboard issue. So, uh, we're, we're represented by Josh Peterman who should be getting on momentarily. All right, great. Thank you. Okay.
Joel, I'm going to go ahead and um, stop sharing my screen once you go through like the beginning, showing people the little hand, um, and then I'll pass over hosting duties to you. I think you're muted. Thank you. And Aubrey, can you start the recording? I started it like half an hour ago, so I wouldn't forget. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Hello, I'm Joel Patterson, um, Salt Lake City Zoning Administrator, and we're going to uh, open the uh, May 13, 2021 appeals hearing. Um, Mary Woodhead is the appeals hearing officer. And Mary, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. I am going to start off by reading a statement about our um, remote meeting. I, Mary Woodhead, appeals hearing officer, hereby determine that conducting public meetings at an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the anchor location. Due to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention social distancing requirements, I find that conducting a meeting at the anchor location constitutes a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the location. Therefore, we are going forward in a virtual format on WebEx today. We have two public hearings on the agenda today. Um, the first, on uh, before I get started, um, I would like to go forward on both public hearings basically the same way, so people will have some information. I'd like to hear from the appellant in each case then from Salt Lake City, and then I will open the public hearing for public comment, and then I'll close the public hearing and um, give the parties a chance to have the last word in each case. Um, the first item on the agenda is an appeal of an administrative decision at approximately 1650 South State um, involving a billboard. Um, owned by Reagan Outdoor Advertising. And the parties in this case are Salt Lake City and Reagan Outdoor Advertising. Salt Lake City is represented, as I understand it, by Samantha Slark. Reagan Outdoor Advertising is represented by Joshua Peterman. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and start that hearing. And I would like to hear from Joshua Peterman first. Oh, be and before we go forward, I've read all the materials, the stack report. In this case, I've gone back and listened to the audio of the previous appeals hearing and looked at some of the documents in that record as well as the staff report. And I did receive some new documents just shortly before the hearing from Mr. Peterman. I had a quick look at those, but really haven't had a chance to um, go through them closely. So, um, I do understand the issues. I understand the background and the history of the case. Um, and I'll have Mr. Peterman go forward with um, the basis for the appeal and his argument. Thank you. 
Thank you. Can you see and hear me okay? Yes. yes. <clears throat> well, good evening. Um, as an initial point, I, I uh, put this in my email that was circulated. I just want to put on the record that we did request a continuance today's hearing in order to obtain uh, copies of some ordinances that we believe will demonstrate that there was a billboard spacing requirement uh, in 1991. That request was denied. Um, and I, I would direct you to page 18 of the staff report. And just for reference, if I'm referencing page numbers throughout this proceeding, it is the staff report for the reason that our appeal is in there as well as the city's response. And I think it's easier to reference one document rather than bounce back and forth between several. So I just direct everybody to, or to page 18 where we did request those ordinances by grandma. The city's response was that copies of the 1991 zoning ordinance are not readily available. <clears throat> I let me just add really quickly that I did see the request for the continuance. I, I don't think it was that specific in terms of what documents you were looking for. But I'm interested um, as we go forward, and I'm certainly open to giving people more time to provide documents and argument if we need to following this. But I would also appreciate some guidance from you as to why you think that's relevant. And I will get to that. I mean, I can I can deal with that now, or I can address that at the time it comes up in our argument. I think it's probably more efficient to address it when it comes up. Uh, but I just wanted to put on the record at the commencement of this proceeding that we did request those. We haven't received them. Um, our understanding is that the only place that does maintain them is the city recorder's office due to COVID. The city recorder's office is not open to the public, so it's even more difficult to maintain, uh, obtain those records. I <clears throat> spoke with the city recorder's office, submitted a request, and was hopeful we would have the ordinances by today, but we do not. Um, additionally, just one other point, the city submitted a document identified as Exhibit F to its uh, Staff report uh, and it's captioned an official city billboard map. This is the first that I or my client has ever seen this. And we would ask that the record be left open so that we can obtain a complete copy of whatever this map is. It appears to simply be a portion of a larger document and we don't know exactly what it is. And so we'd ask the record remain open um, for that purpose as well. So moving on to what's before you today, there are two components to our argument. Uh, the first component is that denial of the building permit is barred by res judicata. And the second is that even if you get to the merits of the appeal, the city's denial should be reversed. So the first point is res judicata. The facts of this matter are as follows, and th these are not in dispute. Reagan applied to construct a billboard at 1650 South State Street uh, to utilizing billboard credits that would be banked by demolition of another existing billboard further south on the same street. On July 17th, 2020, the city denied that application pursuant to city ordinance 21A 46 160 subsection T1, which provides that billboards with an advertising face of 300 square feet or less shall not be closer than 300 linear feet from any other small billboard on the same side of the street. The asserted basis for the city's denial at that time was that there was another billboard around the corner from the proposed location that was within 300 linear feet. This denial was appealed and argued on November 12, 2020. During that appeal, the city not only argued that the billboard around the corner precluded construction at the proposed location, uh, a sign on a tattoo parlor 104 feet to the north on the same side of the street would also, would also support the denial. And in its report, the city has provided a link to the audio from that hearing. I understand that you have reviewed it prior to today. And the argument surrounding what I'll refer to today as the tattoo sign was the city's last argument in that hearing. This is also noted by the hearing officer in his decision. If we look at page 35 of the staff report, the hearing officer uh, recognized, uh, went through the evidence that had been presented and the evidence in, in the record is a document that he titled distance from tattoo sign. And that's what I've also referred to as the tattoo sign. So that document was in the record and the city's argument was in the record at that time that the tattoo sign was too close uh, to the proposed location. On December 10th, 2020, the city's denial was reversed and the city never appealed that decision. 
Uh, Reagan Outdoor subsequently resubmitted its application for this location and the city again denied it, which brings us here today. The city invoked the same ordinance, but this time it alleged that the tattoo sign, not the sign around the corner, supported the denial. Our position is that the city's instant denial is barred by either branch of res judicata, claim preclusion, or issue preclusion. And I assume that you're familiar with the concept of res judicata, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I will go through the, the individual elements of the two prongs of res judicata. But before I get to that, I want to address the city's general argument, which is the first argument in their response that res judicata does not apply to administrative proceedings. That's simply incorrect. Uh, Utah Code Annotated 10 9A701, subsection 3, expressly provides that these proceedings are quasi judicial in nature. Moreover, if we look at it, Utah Supreme Court, Carter Services Review Board versus Utah Department of Corrections, 942nd Pacific 2nd, 933, page 938, the Supreme Court recognized that res judicata, this is a quote, applies to administrative adjudications in Utah. And the doctrine of res judicata has been applied to administrative agency decisions in Utah since at least 1950. The board's adjudication of the appellant's grievance falls within this description. It is the sort of quasi judicial adversary proceeding to which the doctrines of res judicata and collateral estoppel apply. So let me interrupt you really quickly. Is it your position that the decision by Mr. Patterson denying the um, initially denying the billboard on, I'm just looking at this, July 17th, 2020, that judicata applies to that decision? Yes. And that's the administrative decision you're talking about? Well, the what, what it implements res judicata is Mr. Call's final adjudication of the city's denial based on the spacing requirement. And so the city is subsequently barred from arguing that the spacing requirement, the same spacing requirement, prohibits uh, construction of a billboard at that location. Okay, as I understand it, Mr. Call during argument that when that issue was raised, he said basically that's not before me and it may come up again afterwards. So what's your response to that? My response to that is, is Mr. Call made a comment. There was argument on the point by both the city and myself. And he said he, he didn't make any sort of finding. He simply made a comment that it sounds like the city may have another reason on which to deny this. Uh, he says, hold on, I have this comment here in the audio. He noted that uh, it should be noted that if you succeed here, that the city may still claim that you can't build the billboard. That's fine, but that means the issue was before him and whether or not he ruled on that issue or whether or not that issue was sufficiently briefed, it was raised and the city had every opportunity to appeal that decision. And the city chose not to. And because the city chose not to appeal that decision, despite the fact that that issue was before Mr. Call, the city could have appealed that and said, hey, this issue was before you. You could have found that the billboard should have been denied based on that issue as well. The city didn't do that. The city elected not to appeal that. So um, is that issue in your mind properly before Mr. Call? Well, I, I believe it was because, and we get to that under claim preclusion, because the standard is issues that uh, were raised or could have been raised. And this is certainly an issue that could have been raised before Mr. Call. So it doesn't necessarily have to be something that was raised. The so the fact that Mr. Um, Patterson didn't address it, didn't preclude it from being raised later. That's correct. Okay, so you're not saying that any Wait. kind of preclusion arises out of Mr. Patterson's decision? No, maybe I misunderstood. And I'll get to that in a minute. I believe that the city has the same burden as the appellant to raise every reason why a denial would be appropriate. The same as I, on behalf of my client, if I'm appealing a zoning decision, I have to raise all the reasons why we think that decision was incorrect, or those arguments are waived on appeal. So the same burden, this, it's the same standard that applies to the city. Mr. Patterson didn't necessarily put that in his initial determination, but when we got to the appeal hearing, the issue was brought up by the city, that the city made argument, we made counter argument, evidence was submitted into the record showing the spacing between our proposed location and the tattoo sign, and the, the fact that Mr. Call didn't base his decision on that fact 
doesn't change the, the fact that the city didn't appeal that. And so he has, we have a final adjudication that the spacing requirement under the ordinance that I just cited does not preclude uh, construction of a sign at this location. And that takes us to the, the word on claim preclusion now. Um, I think we covered a, a, a little bit of that, but um, I noted in, in, is there, you look like you may have a question and I don't want no, to. Okay, sorry, I apologize. Um, so the elements of claim preclusion is it's, and I've, I put this in, in our brief and I, and I know that you've read it, but they have to involve the same parties. It has to uh, allege to, um, the claim that's alleged to be barred has, must have been presented in the first suit or here's what's important, must have been one that could have been raised in the first action. And third, the first suit must result in a final adjudication on the merits. These elements are easily met. These are the same parties, you can't dispute that. And it involves the exact same spacing ordinance. Uh, and, and it's an issue that not only could have been raised or a claim that not only could have been raised in the first proceeding, it it actually was raised. So we're beyond this should have. Even if it wasn't raised, I think claim preclusion bars it because it, it should have been raised. There's no dispute that tattoo sign was there at the time that the first appeal uh, was heard. And third, the first suit must have resulted in a final judgment on the merits. Again, this is a quasi-judicial proceeding. Mr. Call's decision is a final adjudication for purposes of the administrative appeal, the next step would be the district court. The city's position on that is that the claim preclusion doesn't apply because it did not. It's a very short argument. They say we didn't assert an affirmative cause of action, but that's an oversimplification of what res judicata or what claim preclusion covers. And it's also inconsistent with the case uh, that I just cited, indicating that claim preclusion applies in administrative proceedings. You don't have typical causes of action in administrative proceedings. So the simple fact that the city didn't file a, a complaint alleging causes of action captioned that way doesn't mean that their claim was not addressed. And so I think the city has, has misstated. That's the only argument they, they raise with regard to claim preclusion, that because they didn't have a, a formal cause of action, claim preclusion doesn't apply. And again, um, there, there are several cases I cited that the court, the one that I thought the were you know, the one that I thought was um, most on point, and that's the uh, career services case I just talked about. Um, the, and again, I, I don't mean to be redundant, but the tattoo sign was there at the time the first appeal was heard, and not only should the city have raised the claim, it did in fact raise the claim, and under City Mortgage Inc. versus Stevenson 2015 Utah Appellate 205, Claim preclusion operates as a complete bar to a section to a second action based on a claim that was or could have been raised in a prior action. It's not a partial bar, it's a complete bar under our case law. So moving on to the second problem, which is issue preclusion, it's similar and they're fairly easily confused, but the elements are slightly different. The elements in issue preclusion are the party against whom it's asserted must have been a party. Again, we have we've met that it's the same parties. The issue decided in the prior adjudication must be identical to the one presented in the instant action. The issue in the first action must have been completely fully and fairly litigated, and the first suit must have resulted in a final judgment on the merits. Again, we've met these elements. It's the same parties as I just indicated. It's also the exact same issue, and that is whether or not the the ordinance 21A, the 300 foot spacing requirement applies. It was also fairly litigated and we have a final judgment. There's no allegation that the city didn't have an opportunity to raise that issue. There's no allegation that the city didn't raise that issue. Again, their, their remedy would have been appeal an appeal of Mr. Call's decision if they believe that he overlooked something. But the city's response to the issue preclusion argument is that the tattoo sign is a new issue that was not raised. But that's not accurate. As stated earlier, it was argued and evidence related to the spacing of that tattoo sign was entered into the record. Um, allowing the city to do this would result in the very type of redundant wasteful litigation that the doctrine of race judicata is created to prevent. For example, what if the city had 10 reasons to deny a building permit? It could assert them one at a time. Somebody applies for a building permit, they could say well, it's denied on this basis. You go, you have an appeal, if the city doesn't succeed on the appeal, it then brings up its second reason to deny the building permit. It, it doesn't operate that way. It's no different from the city side. And I touched on this a little bit earlier. It's no different from the city side as it as it is from the appellant side. If you're appealing a denial, you have to raise every basis in which the denial was incorrect or those arguments are barred by res judicata. 
In other words, if if Reagan Outdoor had lost the first appeal, we would not have been able to come back a second time with a new argument based on facts that were already in existence at the time that that appeal was heard and get a second appeal. You can be certain the city would would be arguing that you had your shot, you didn't raise it, you therefore it's not you waived it. So and do you think Mr. Call committed error by not considering those arguments by the city? No, I think it's it's a case where if you have um, multiple reasons on which to deny something, I mean, sometimes courts don't reach a conclusion on every matter that's before it. And I don't think Mr. Call did. And again, the city, the city had a remedy. The city could have appealed it and said, Mr. Call, by the way, you you didn't uh, you didn't look at the fact that there's a tat that that tattoo sign is there, but they didn't so do that. So was addressing the street facing issues in the distance part of the ordinance. He should have gone beyond that. Well, I think because the issue was put in front of him that that would have been appropriate to do. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. So there, there's a case, it's Nebaker versus Utah State Tax Commission, it's 2001 Utah 74. And in there, there the, the facts aren't the same, but, the, but the, the, the legal analysis is the same. It was an appellant who filed a second appeal before the tax commission and the Utah Supreme Court held that he had waived those claims by not bringing them in the first proceeding before the, the tax commission. And his support for its decision, this is what the Supreme Court held said this decision is supported by sound policy considerations. To begin, to hold otherwise would create procedural confusion and piecemeal litigation as demonstrated by this very case. We're now involved in two actions over the same subject, requiring filing of the constitutional claim, which is the one he tried to raise in the second action. In the initial proceeding, eliminate such confusion by creating a single action to address all issues. So that's the burden that's on the appellant. And again, the same should be applied to the city. If the city has numerous spaces on which it believes it can deny a permit, it needs to raise them all. And it can't just come back time after time after time and raise new reasons based on facts that were in existence at the time. Um, so at so the end of his decision, Mr. Call says he agrees with your interpretation of the ordinance and finds that the city's interpretation isn't entitled to any deference and is incorrect, but he doesn't order the city to um, grant the permit for the billboard. Does that matter? Well, I think that that's the that's what happens when the city's denial is reversed. That the, the permit needs to be granted. Okay. And maybe it, maybe it's just the way it's worded. Um, Well, at the, at the beginning, it says the appeal is granted as explained below and the basis for and our re, the relief requested in our appeal was that the decision be reversed and the permit be granted. Okay. So okay. it sounds to me like uh, Mr. Call granted um, our appeal, which was for the permit to be issued. Um, so unless you have any questions on the res judicata, res judicata aspect of this, I'll move on to it. Second part. No, thank you. That, that was helpful. Well, the second component is that even if you reach the merits of this appeal, the, the denial uh, should still be reserved, reversed as follows. As noted by Reagan and the city uh, in the briefing, Reagan has a sign currently located at 1600 South State Street, and that's noted on page 22 of the staff report. And this sign has been in existence and properly permit permitted by the city since the 1960s. The, the date. Um, sorry, I just have to. On page 20, 20 of the staff report, uh, you'll note that the date is August 27th of 1963. And the sign has been there continuously since that time. So not only does this sign have a city permit, it's permit number 232, it has a UDOT permit, and here's why it has a UDOT permit. So, uh, as I, again, I explained this in our brief, State Street is considered a controlled route, and billboards on a controlled route must not only have a city permit, they must also be permitted by the Utah Department of Transportation. In order to get a UDOT permit, you must first have a permit from the city. 
And we've shown that Reagan has both for the sign located at 1600 South State Street. We look at page 22, uh, where the spacing issue between the tattoo sign and that is, is noted. The tattoo sign on which the city is based, the instant denial is located 205 feet south of Reagan's existing sign at 1600 South State Street. And so this brings us to why we need to see the 1991 zoning ordinance. The city's indicated that it cannot produce those ordinances. What else the city also can't produce in, in its briefing, it's, it's acknowledged, it cannot produce a billboard permit for this sign. What it does is the city speculates that it must have been approved in 1991, which is almost 30 years after Reagan's sign was there because a sign permit was issued in 1991. So we look at the historical ordinance. What were the ordinances in effect in 1991? And earlier today, I, we, my client and I dug through several decades of files to see what we could come up with to locate those. And I submitted some supplemental documentation based on what we could determine without actual access to the ordinance in effect at that time. And what we um, were able to determine was this, is that as early as 1976, the city had enacted an ordinance establishing spacing requirements for billboards. And I can share my screen and point that out, or I can direct you to um, the tab that that was. That would be identified as spacing requirement or spacing ordinance 1976 in the PDF that was um, sent prior to, to the hearing. Okay. And, and, and I do have said, those documents. And if we look at ordinance uh, number four, it says ordinance number four of 1976, amending section 51-7-420, establishing spacing requirements for off-premises off signs. That's a good indication that there was a spacing requirement as early as 1976. And then in 1980, Reagan applied for a billboard permit. And there was a notation on that application that says this location is more than 300 feet from the next billboard. And that is the document that we've identified as spacing requirement 1980. It's a yellow and at the end it's handwritten and then it's signed um, by a party. That's a good indication that in 1980, there was a 300 foot spacing requirement between off premise signs. In 1986, Reagan applied for another sign and a condition as noted by the city on that permit application is that in 1986, there's a condition imposed on this permit. It's permit number 72806. It says, as per applicant site plan, no other off-premise sign or permit issued for the same within 400 feet per section 51-7-402 subsection II. City sign regulations. And that's dated November 25th, 1986. So in 1986, we presume that there was an ordinance that said off-premise signs can't be located closer than 400 feet from each other. The sign, the tattoo sign is in 1991. The city asks you to assume that it was per properly permitted as a billboard, which is simply, that, that is, that's quite the stretch. And the reason being because the city's regulations of off-premise signs did not get less restrictive as time went on. They have only gotten more and more restrictive. The city has repeatedly expressed or set forth its policy of limiting the number of off-premises signs in the city. So if it was 400 feet in 1986, we assume it's going to be at least that in 1991. Assu simply assuming that it was permitted as a billboard, which is very different than a regular sign would be against the evidence that you have before you. Now, I also submitted today three building permit applications from 1974, 1980, and 1993. And those are uh, titled um, permit application 1974, permit application 1980, permit application 1993. And the reason we submitted those is if you look at those building permit applications, the city differentiates between billboards and regular signs. If we, for example, if we look at the 1980 application, there's a checkbox as to what kind of sign you're putting up. Is it a billboard? Is it a new fashion? Is it a canopy? You have to identify that it's a billboard because billboards are treated very differently than other, than other signs. 
And the same goes goes for the other um, applications that we've submitted. <clears throat> so what we what is is reasonable to assume is that this location may have been permitted to have some sort of sign on it. The city has not been able to produce anything showing that it was permitted as a billboard. So it's reasonable to assume that it might have been permitted as a sign, but it was never permitted as a billboard. Also supporting this is we provided you with a copy of the UDOT, Out, UDOT Outdoor Advertising Control Map, and I indicated earlier um, that you can't get a UDOT permit without a city permit. And that this tattoo sign does not show up on UDOT's billboard map. And the reason being because it's never been permitted by UDOT, and that's page 16 of the staff report. And the reason is UDOT, UDOT, I just said that will not permit a billboard without a proper city bill, uh, billboard permit. The spacing requirements in the ordinance cited by the city to deny uh, Reagan's permit relate to billboards. The spacing requirement does not say that if you have a, a small sign located less than 300 feet from another sign, it's prohibited. It's 300 feet from another billboard. And the fact that a property owner north of our, our proposed location may be using a, a, a sign for off-premise advertising purposes does not convert it to a billboard. If, if they might have a sign permit, that's fine, but it doesn't make it a building a billboard permit. And the reason being because a billboard permit could not have been issued for that location in 1991, because that sign is only 200 feet south of Reagan's existing sign on that side of the street. Isn't that a little bit circular to say it can't be a billboard because it doesn't have a billboard permit? Even if it's an off premise sign, is it possible that it's a billboard, just not a properly permitted billboard? I mean, is a billboard well, defined by its permitting and nothing else? You have to have it's a, a billboard is, a, is an off premise sign. The, the definitions go back and forth with each other. And in order to conduct off premise advertising on a sign, you have to have a billboard permit, an off premise advertising permit from the city. And so it may have been permitted as a sign in 1991, but it could not have been permitted as a billboard because it was too close to Reagan's existing sign. There was no. It could I understand what you're saying that it can't have been permitted as a billboard, but is it the case that if it's not permitted as a billboard, it's not a billboard? Yeah, because billboards have special rights assigned to them. For example, you get to bank your credits. When you take a billboard down, if you if you demolish a billboard, you apply for a demolition permit and you bank your credits and then you can use them elsewhere in the city. Taking an on premise sign and using it for off premise advertising in violation of the city ordinance doesn't convert it to a billboard. And I suspect the city would agree with that because that would create some real problems for the city's uh, attempts to regulate the number of billboards in the city. So simply because this property owner may be using it for an improper purpose doesn't make it a billboard under the ordinance. And the ordinance relates to billboards that are permitted by the city. And our billboard is more than our proposed billboard is more than 300 feet from the only other permitted billboard on that side. Okay, of the so it's not an unlawful billboard. It's just not a billboard. We don't, I, it's just it's not a billboard. It's, okay. it's probably a sign that's being improperly used as a billboard, but that doesn't make it a billboard. Okay. okay. So to summarize this, the tattoo sign was not, could not have been permitted under the ordinances that we believe existed in 1991. Our proposed sign is 310 feet from the existing sign at 1600 South State Street. We've provided you with um, documentation showing the measurements. Therefore, it, fu it fully complies with the ordinance. It's 310 feet from the next closest billboard on the same side of the street, which is what the city's ordinance applies to. And therefore the city's decision to deny our permit based on the tattoo sign. Uh, really, the tattoo sign is a red herring and the city's decision to deny the permit should be reversed. So unless you have any uh, questions at this time, I have nothing. No, I think yeah. I interrupted you enough, but thank you. <laughs> that was helpful. We'll hear from the city now. Um, <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, so I think uh, Mr. Peterman made really clear that they um, essentially raising two arguments in response to um, the city's recent denial um, of the request for a permit and um, just to repeat and provide some structure the denial um, on this occasion 
is uh, because this billboard is within 300 feet of the, the tattoo billboard. Um, Megan has responded raising a res judicata argument and also an argument that um, it claims that this billboard isn't properly permitted. Um, with respect to res judicata, um, the city's position, I guess, is threefold. <clears throat> First, um, the case cited by the city in its briefing indicates that uh, res judicata doesn't apply carte blanche to all administrative hearings. And I think there's some very helpful language in that case that says that you have to look at the nature of the hearing to determine whether it's trial-like enough to um, be a type of administrative hearing to which um, res judicata applies. Um, I was unable to find any cases that applied res judicata to land use appeal authorities. Um, they were, for the most part, it was workforce and labor commission cases, which are kind of like little semi-trials in which they were applied in the administrative setting. Um, so the observation is that there's no Utah case law out there saying, you know, finding that a land use appeal authority is sufficiently trial-like in nature for res judicata to apply. Um, the second point, um, I'll really split into two parts, I guess, rather than making three points, is that there are two do doctrines of res judicata. One of them is claim preclusion, and one of them is issue pre preclusion. And, you know, as the name bespeaks, claim preclusion um, prohibits somebody from bringing the same claim against somebody over and over again. Um, and Mr. Peterman kind of referenced this in his argument, and I think you'll find in the administrative cases but the circumstances where claim preclusion is alleged are circumstances where that administrative agency is bringing kind of enforcement action against somebody. So one of them was a dentist who was having his license taken away um, is the one that comes to mind. But obviously in that circumstance, you've got an administrative body bringing a claim against somebody in kind of an enforcement scenario. So that fits exactly with the idea of claim preclusion, which is to prevent repeatedly bringing the same claim against somebody. So, of course, here, the city's not bringing any claim against Reagan. So, the doctrine of res judicata, which would be applicable in this circumstance, if it did apply, would be issue preclusion. And the idea of issue preclusion is not to repeatedly litigate the same issue over and over again. So, if I've argued in a previous matter exactly the same issue and it got resolved, you don't get to argue it again in the next um, hearing. Um, I think Mr. Peterman did a nice job of setting out the elements of issue preclusion in his briefing, and it's really the second point that is the most pertinent here to our analysis, because it says that the issue must have been decided in the prior adjudication, and it must be identical to the one presented in the instant action. <clears throat> so, as we know, um, the issue that was decided in the prior um, adjudication was the issue of whether a billboard that was um, facing 1700 South, whether that was precluded by the spacing ordinance. The issue of whether the billboard's proximity to the tattoo billboard was not decided in the prior matter at all. Um, it's certainly the city, I certainly raised it, but Mr. Cole did not decide it. And the fact that he just references what documents are in the record in the prior matter doesn't show that he decided the issue. And I think that the transcript or the hearing makes clear that he is not he is deciding not to decide that. And he's making the parties aware that this is going to be an issue that's going to be resolved or that needs to be addressed, you know, regardless of if, if this appeal gets reversed and it goes back down. Let me ask you this question, which is a little bit maybe slightly off topic, but what I mean, what do you think about the argument Mr. Peterman made um, that this is a, the city should have raised this to start with and insisted that it be decided because otherwise an applicant like Reagan applies for a permit, it's rejected. And it could be rejected for multiple reasons, but the decision only lists one. 
that gets appealed and then something that wasn't listed the first time is now a new reason to reject it and that could happen you know multiple times well candidly we did raise it and um mr cole decided not to decide it uh, he decided that it needed to go back down to be decided so i think that should mr one. patterson should mr patterson have decided it referenced it when he explained why he wasn't granting the permit I mean, I guess one way is to raise them all at once, but I don't think that it's um, required either because it happens numerous times when you're going through a permitting process and um, you, you have to request various things as you're going along, like some stuff gets submitted and you say, well, this is going to be denied because here's a problem and you send it back to the applicant. Then the applicant sends in some additional materials and then you look at those and sometimes it gets resolved or maybe it raises some other issue. So you send that back out. So it's not a process like, you know, like an appeal, like to a court of appeals where like, you've got a frozen record, it's all right there in front of you. So I don't think that that argument really applies in the permitting process because it is this sort of fungible process that goes back and forth a lot. And it, you know, it's constantly you're acquiring, you know, additional documents or this, that, and the next thing. So it's not unusual to deal with like, an, like issue by issue. Um, so I, do, I and I also think it's a pretty unusual circumstance where there are two grounds to deny a permit uh, or, or permit on. It's usually going to come down to one issue. Okay, go ahead. Um, so really, that kind of summarises the city's position with um, reject with respect to um, the res judicata argument. One, it's it's fairly unclear whether that the principles of res judicata apply to um, land use appeal authorities that are created under 109A. Um, and number two, issue preclusion is the only doctrine that would apply, and it really specifically requires um, that the uh, issue decided in the prior adjudication is identical to the issue raised in the next one, and I think that's clearly not the case here. So moving on to the second round um, that Reagan is appealing under, which is this concept that it's Reagan's position that the tattoo billboard um, doesn't have all the permits it's, that are required. And therefore the city just must ignore the fact that there is a billboard sitting there and provide Reagan um, its permit. So we have several responses to that. <clears throat> the first one is that there is nothing in the city's billboard ordinance that limits this 300 foot spacing requirement to billboards that hold all required permits. So, like, I don't know, take this example, say we're not fighting over the circumstance with regard to a UDOT permit, is, are we, if, if somebody, if the city had given a permit to another billboard, Reagan, and that billboard doesn't then follow up and go to UDOT and get an appropriate UDOT permit, is the city then going to be compelled to provide a um, new permit to somebody who wants to come within 100 feet of that based on the fact that this billboard company didn't go and satisfy its state obligation. That doesn't seem to make very much sense, sense at all. So if the spacing requirement exists, there's nothing in the ordinance that says that the spacing requirement is contingent on the existing billboard being fully permitted. Um, so I think that's the first and probably the clearest and easiest point that um, I'd like to make. The second point, and I've kind of touched on this a little bit, and um, it was in uh, Mr. Peterson's briefing, but I'm not sure if he really touched on it today, an argument that um, commented that the uh, tattoo billboard doesn't have a UDOT permit. Well, UDOT permits come from the state, and there's not a whole lot we can do about that if they don't have a UDOT permit. Um, but uh, the, this tattoo billboard is marked on the city's official billboard map. It's got this inventory where it's got all these billboards on it. It's not really new news to Reagan. They've known about this for a long time and it's marked on there as billboard number 165. So, you know, we've got it on there. We've recognized it as a, a billboard. So it's there. Um, fourth, you know, we've looked through, our, we're talking about records now that are 19, 30 years old. So obviously the city has, you know, retention schedules like everyone else paper applications as subject to like seven year retention schedules. And that's, you know, from when these things were done. So clearly we don't have a whole lot left from 30 years ago, um, including, you know, uh, 
permits that would have been issued to Reagan, they obviously have a lot more that they've kept for a lot longer. What we have been able to um, find um, on the public facing, and this is available on the public facing website as well, is that a sign permit was issued to this address in 1991. So that appears to be um, a, you know, a permit that was issued um, to this billboard. Um, and I guess the last argument, um, which I will need to, I'd like to address, and it feels like it's sort of in very many parts, is this argument that um, has been raised by Reagan that this can't possibly be a properly permitted billboard because it's within 300 feet of um, you know, a, a 1963 billboard from Reagan. <clears throat> and I don't really know, sort of, number one, who knows? Like, we're talking 30 years ago. So perhaps the city mistakenly issued a permit. I don't know. We don't have the records. However, I think a couple of other things are probably helpful to note here is that we, um, Reagan submitted like an, what, what looks like an application for a billboard for its 1963 permit. It doesn't have like the permit number up in the right hand corner like its other permits do. And we also went back and you know took a look at what limited paper records we have from that time. And I'm told by the building services that they you know keep index cards and they would put the permit number. But we don't have a record of this their billboard um, that's like this 1963 billboard either. So it's kind of what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Like we don't have, a, like the best we've got is Reagan telling us that they've got a permit, here it is. And then we've got this other sign permit going out to this 1991 one. So I'm not quite sure what, um, what position that leaves us in. Um, but I, I would say, and I think I'd like, I like to finish on this, is this idea that it's not a billboard unless it's got all proper permits from UDOT and from um, the city. Well, I think you'll find if you look at the definition of billboard in the city's ordinances, that billboards are defined as freestanding signs without or advertising on them. So nothing, they're not defined in terms of whether they're permitted or not permitted. So a billboard is a billboard if it's, a, if it, it, if it's you know, a billboard structure that has outdoor advertising on it. And uh, Mr. Peterman also, uh, reference, you know, all these other kind of rights that it says that billboards have. I think that it would be pertinent to note that uh, he's talking about billboard credits and um, the use of credits to build stuff. That all came in in an ordinance in 1993. Um, and to the extent that um, the sort of complaints about not having that information, it's all public facing. It's on the city's ordinance website and it's public facing and you can find that just by clicking on those links. So that's when the billboard ordinance was enacted with the billboard credit. So I'm not sure how relevant that argument is at all to fighting over the legitimacy of a 1991 permit versus a 1963 permit. Okay, thank you. I am going to go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, Aubrey or Joel, um, do you have, are there people who are prepared to make public comment on this? And I'd like to limit public comment to two minutes per person. Is there anyone? Uh, there are several people in the audience. Um, one is, excuse me, one has raised their hand, Kate. Kopischke, apologize if I've mispronounced your name, Kate. Um, and we, Kate, would you like to make some comments? Okay, Kate, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, I was trying to figure out how to unmute myself. Can you hear me? I, I think you unmuted yourself, and then I hit the button and undid it. So I apologize okay. for that. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I'm Kate with Scenic Utah. We're a nonprofit scenic preservation organization. We work statewide to promote and protect Utah scenic resources. Um, among the groups that we represent across the state are Utahns and visitors who are opposed to the proliferation of billboards. Um, and in fact, we received multiple inquiries inquiries about the application to put this new billboard on State Street and what could be done to prevent it. So we get a lot of people asking us that. 
Um, we agree with the public comments that were already submitted by people who support the city's denial to allow this billboard and also agree with the city's current spacing requirements for small signs and don't see any reason why an exception for, should be made for this sign. Um, regardless of the legal technicalities or whatever claim preclusion issues were raised or not raised, it's clear that the reason for the spacing requirements, um, the reason the city sign requirements have gotten more and not less restrictive, and the reason for the denial of the application is that this city doesn't want new billboards. It wants to reduce the number and not increase it. Um, Salt Lake City and most other cities in Utah work really hard to set and enforce ordinances to stop the proliferation of billboards in our communities. Um, and in fact, most cities in Utah ban new billboards and they're trying to keep them at a minimum. Um, but industry consistently raises complex legal arguments. They seek and receive legislative backing and hire armies of attorneys and lobbyists and all with the goal of increasing your inventory. Um, State Street is an important gateway into Salt Lake City, and we support the goals of it's a, I think it's called Life on State Street Implementation Plan to revitalize State Street to include more pedestrian and aesthetic features that are more consistent with walkable and livable communities. And the addition of more billboards is totally inconsistent with that goal. Um, and finally, we think it's a little ironic that Reagan is arguing that this denial, if the denial stands, that time and money would be wasted on future litigation because Reagan is one of the most litigious companies in Utah and is responsible for many hundreds of thousands of hours of needless litigation in our view. And also ironic that they're claiming that the denial should be overturned by claiming that the Resolute Tattoo billboard is illegal because it's not permitted. And you've talked a lot about this, but a huge number of billboards around the city that are owned by Reagan were never permitted because of how old they are. They were billboards that were elected, erected long before there were zoning laws. And so they were never required to obtain permits. They just simply grandfathered in Time. once the zoning laws were enacted. So that's um, we think we uh, we agree with the city's denial and hope that they'll stick to it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Are there is there any other public comment? Uh, yes, it looks like uh, Mr. Dewey Reagan has raised his hand. Yes, am I, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Um, the, the first thing that I'd, I'd like to address um, is you asked if that um, the tattoo sign was being illegally used as a billboard as, as part of your question to Mr. Peterman. And from uh, our perspective, it is. Uh, in all likelihood, it was permitted as an on-premise sign, not a billboard. And after a while, it, was, it probably initially was used as an on-premise sign. When I say on-premise, a sign for uh, the business that was there. And then at some point in time, the owner of the property decided that he was going to just get a, a vinyl printed and, and put it up to, to advertise uh, for um, goods and services that weren't sold on the property. So from uh, Reagan's perspective, it is being used illegally as a billboard. Um, with regards to the last uh, person that commented, um, this uh, approving this does not increase the number of billboards in Salt Lake City. In fact, the uh, another sign is coming down to uh, be erected here as part of the application because since 1993, Salt Lake City has not allowed for um, for new billboards. And then finally, with the comment that Reagan has lots of signs that weren't permitted that were grandfathered in, having done the research personally for this matter, I disagree with that. Uh, we provided you several permits today, go going back to, um, uh, I think, 1963. And during the course of my research, I was able to find permits that went back as far as 1955. So, so I, let me interrupt you. Do you have any any billboards that are grandfathered in? So my research that I conducted, um, and I'm not certain whether I I can't be certain whether I got all of them or not. I was able to find permits for, in our files. I don't know if I looked at every one that we have in Salt Lake City, but I was able to find find permit applications for them, permit applications, permits, receipts. 
Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. That's it. Thank you for your time. Okay, is there further public comment? Uh, nobody else has their hands raised, but there are uh, a few people in the audience. And if you don't mind, we can pull them and see if they'd like to, to speak. Uh, Mr. Thur, would you like to speak on this issue? Not hearing from him. Uh, Mr. Newell, would you like to speak on this issue? No, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pace, would you like to uh, speak on this issue? No response there. No. Thank you. Um, that's that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to close the public hearing. And I will bring this matter back and hear from Mr. Peterman again, and then hear from the city. So, Mr. Peterman, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think I covered everything in my initial argument, but I do uh, want to just make one point that the city's argument is essentially that the, the ordinance doesn't say that it's only spacing between billboards permitted billboards, that it says it's spacing between billboards. To accept that, <clears throat> you would have to, you would have, it would result in any property owner being able to convert their sign, on-premise sign, to a billboard simply by illegally putting off-premise advertising on the face of that sign. That certainly is not the intent of the, of the ordinances. That's certainly not the purpose of the ordinances. And the city can, I, it sounds like the city's arguing that a property owner can convert an on-premise sign to a billboard and be subject to the laws, not only the laws and regulations, but also the benefits that come along with owning a billboard, simply if you violate the city's ordinance and put off-premise advertising on an on-premise sign. And so that's what this, you, let me interrupt you, because what, what the city said is that this um, sign um, I'll call it a sign so as not to prejudice any particular point of view, is um, on the city's billboard map. Yes. So it's not that, um, so we can't presume that the owner just sort of randomly, you know, um, decided to make, it, make what wasn't a billboard into a billboard. It's on the map. It's just that we don't know exactly how it came to be there. But assuming that it's not legal, your assumption is, is that if it's not legal, it can't be held against Reagan, Reagan's distance. Is that right? That's correct. And going back to the billboard map, there was a comment by council that we've known about it for a long time. That's incorrect. This is the first time we've seen this. We don't know what it was based on. Was it simply somebody from the city driving around looking, saying there's a billboard, there's a billboard? When was it created? Did the city make any effort to, to craft this billboard map based on permits it had in its system? I think it's a little bit, it's difficult, it's tough to believe that the city does not maintain copies of building permits that have been issued because at the last hearing we had in front of Mr. Call, the city strenuously argued that simply because something may have been permitted in the past, mistakenly does not prevent the city from now coming and enforcing uh, its ordinances. And in fact, so council- So will Reagan, will Reagan file a um, you know, concern with the zoning department about the tattoo billboard and ask that it be um, you know, found to be illegal? That I don't believe that we have any, I don't believe that that's our place to do that. It's not, it's not Reagan's place to enforce city ordinances. I mean, I mean so most, I mean, people file complaints with the city all the time about ordinance violations. Yeah. And oftentimes enforcement is, is based on uh, reporting that it's reporting based um, enforcement. But what I can tell you is that billboard ordinance enforcement is not based on citizen complaints okay. it is rigorously billboards are rigorously enforced by both the city and the state and 
it's not again. Uh, the city's argument, they made this argument uh, in the 1st hearing that it's somehow our duty. To file a, some sort of action against the property owner that they're using have an illegal billboard, but that's not that's not our place to do that. No, no, I wasn't suggesting that you file something against the property owner. Um, well, but I do have a question if if this if if a decision in favor of Reagan would partly have to be based on a finding that the tattoo billboard is illegal. Should they be a party to this? No, it, it's it's not. It's not that the bill that the sign is illegal. It's that the use of the sign is illegal. There, there apparently was a sign permit given, but if you drive down State Street, there are thousands of signs, literally right. thousands of signs for on premise. And so the issue is not that this entire sign is illegal. The issue is that the property owner is using it in an illegal manner for off premise advertising. Right, and can I make that finding that they're using it illegally without them being a party? Yeah, absolutely. And I understand that, that we're going back several years on this, but I think if you look at the ordinance at the time and the zealousness with zealousness with which the city has enforced its ordinances when people apply for billboard permits, that at the time, the way the ordinance was drafted, the city would never have permitted this as a billboard. The spacing requirements would not have allowed it based on Reagan's existing sign from the 60s. And so that's uh, an adjoining, or not an adjoining, but a, but a, a, another landowner in the vicinity who is, is illegally using an on premise sign as an off premise sign does not impl uh, implicate the spacing requirements between billboards as between Reagan and what happens to be another one of its signs further to the north. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and so, you unless you have any else? questions, I no. Unless you have any other additional questions, I have nothing further. Um, I do have one more question. If I were to give you extra time, if you still want it, how much extra time would you want? Well, uh, that's difficult to say because grammar requests are taking longer to get back than than in normal times. Um, I mean, if we can get them back, I, I would I would ask that we will advise you as soon as we receive a response and receive this ordinance from 1991. I, I don't. The city alleges that the city does not have it. And well, what they say is they're not readily available to the city. I don't think not readily available is a basis on which the city cannot respond to a grammar request. But that being said, going to the city recorder is going to be a whole lot more expeditious than fighting uh, this the city's response to our grammar request. So uh, I think I can put in a grammar request for this city billboard map that we've never seen before and get some more information on that. I suspect the city will respond to that within a couple of weeks and I am hopeful that the city recorder will do the same. So we would ask for 21 days. If in fact, we don't get the information by then, um, we can alert you that the grammar responses have not been received yet and perhaps get an additional extension because we have, we're not in control of when the information is received. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Ms. Slark, go ahead. Yeah, um, I just respond, I guess, to the three points that Mr. Peterman made. Um, first, you're correct, it is a complaint based system. Um, like if somebody files a complaint with the city, that's generally how things and enforcement come to the city's attention. Um, Second, I'd like to kind of provide an example, which I think illustrates um, the difficulty of the argument that um, Reagan is making here. So the argument that Reagan is making is that um, the city should ignore its spacing requirements because the city doesn't have definitive proof that it issued um, ta the tattoo part of the tattoo billboard, a city permit 30 years ago. So let's transfer that argument to a similar circumstance that I referenced here earlier. So we've been provided a document by Reagan that says that it has um, a permit from 1963, but that's not got all the signatures on it and it doesn't have that permit number up in the top right hand corner like many of the other permits that were provided sort of right before this hearing today. And from having spoken to with our folks at building services, they said that they kept the 
they kept index cards of like permit numbers from that time. And so they've been unable to find that. So it looks like we kind of have a similar circumstance with the tattoo parlor. We've got something that looks like a billboard and it was issued at one time to the tattoo people. And it looks like it was also issued at one time to the Reagan people. So let's take the argument that Reagan's making today. Are we, if they want to go put another billboard within 100 feet of their 1963 billboard, we don't have definitive proof that there was a billboard uh, permit issued to Reagan in 1963. Are we supposed to just disregard our spacing ordinance and allow that billboard there? That seems like an absurd result that doesn't make any sense. Um, and then I guess to uh, address the last points, uh, Mr. Peterman um, was, I guess, planning to make um, a couple more grammar requests. And one of them is with regard to um, an ordinance. And I think if it goes back and reviews the response with respect to, he requested um, the Title 21A ordinance from 1991 and the response um, informed um, Reagan um, or Ms. Um, that the Title 21 wasn't enacted until after um, 1991. So, you know, that's not possible to produce that. But also, um, as we referenced before, all of the ordinances are available on the public facing website. And so a grammar request will likely get the similar response. Go to, the, you know, when you've got, grammar doesn't require you to produce documents that are publicly available and they're all publicly available. So I'd encourage Mr. Peterman to take a look at that website um, to find the ordinances he's looking for. And they date back to 19, I don't know, very early 1900s. So he'll be able to find whatever it is he's looking for. May, may I just respond briefly to that? Sure, go ahead. We, our, our interest is getting everything on the table. The city's grammar request, that's correct. We, we, we requested 21A. The city recognized that that's a recodified version of what we were asking for. And the city said, in 1991, the city began the rewrite project of zoning ordinances, and there is not a readily available copy of the 1991 zoning ordinance. We asked for the ordinance in effect in 91. The city says it's not readily available. Today, council says, you can just go online. What we produced, the 1976 spacing ordinance today, that's what's online. And you can see ordinance number four of 1976, amending section 517420, establishing spacing requirements for off-premise signs. That's what's available. You can't get, they're not available. It's, I, I would appreciate, if council thinks it's that easy, then council can simply access them and email them to us. But we have been unbelievably frustrated at the lack of ability of anyone to obtain copies of historical ordinances from Salt Lake City. So to say that they're readily available is just simply not correct. Okay. Anything else from anyone on this matter? Okay, so this is my intent. Um, I am going to go ahead and give Reagan an additional 21 days to submit any documents that they are able to find that they believe will be helpful to support their argument. Should they make a submission, I will give Salt Lake City an extra 10 days to respond to that. Is that acceptable, Ms. Slark? Um, and I will take the matter under advisement until I receive the materials. Um, I will say that I'm not inclined to extend it beyond 21 days because I think that the fundamental framework of your, your um, argument is on the record with other documents. But I think if you can produce some, something additional, I'm happy to take a look at it. And to some extent, you know, the, um, I don't wanna use the word injury, but Reagan is the party whose matter is delayed by, you know, these additional extensions. Um, and I, but I think it's in the interest of the city and, and everyone to have it closed, you know, in a reasonable amount of time. So I'm give, gonna give you that 21 days. I'm gonna give Salt Lake City an additional 10 days. And then once I get that, those materials, should you find something to submit, I will um, review them and make a decision shortly thereafter. Is that acceptable to everyone? Yes, thank you. 
Okay, thank you. I'm going to close um, this matter. And um, are we ready to move to the second matter on the agenda? Yes, we are. And Chrissy Gilmore is the planner who will be handling um, the variance case. Okay, that's um, great. So the matter we are now hearing is a variance for a modified rear yard setback at 2829 East Glen Oaks Drive. Um, the appellants are Stephen Miller, and I don't want to mispronounce the name, but Sneha Parikh. Um, and please correct me when you come on the record. Um, I don't know if you heard my um, opening statement, but I have read all the materials. I'm familiar with the staff report. So I will go ahead and hear from the appellant and then I will hear from Salt Lake City. I understand the issues. I will then open it for public comment and then bring it back to the parties to respond. Is that acceptable? Yeah. Okay, so I will, uh, according to my note, Stephen Miller will be the presenter on this. So I um, turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Um, hello and good evening. Um, I'm Stephen Miller and I'm here with my wife, Sneha Parikh. Um, together, we are the owners of the property at 2829 Glen Oaks Drive. Uh, Title 21A provides specific standards for variances in section 18.060. states that a variance may be issued if all the conditions in that section are met. Our application clearly demonstrates with evidence that our property and project meet the standards set forth there. So I just want to quickly discuss each of the items in that section and share what we've provided in compliance with them. Page numbers I referenced throughout this are from the staff report, which contains all the elements of our application. Starting with the first standard, literal enforcement of this title would cause an unreasonable hardship for the applicant that is not necessary to carry out the general purposes of this title. So literal enforcement of the 35 foot rear yard setback causes us unreasonable hardship because we wanna expand the living space within our home like others in our neighborhood have. And there's only one appropriate area on our property to accomplish that within the general purposes of Title 21A, the Northwest corner. So can I just interrupt you? And I'm sorry to do this so quickly, yeah. but I noticed that there was um, a fair amount of additional setback available on some of the other frontages. Can you tell me why those aren't available? Yeah, I was just about to get to that. Um, so, for, so first, the, the rear of the home is the only area of the property that's naturally level. Um, and then second, along the rear of the house, Building in the northwest corner meets the minimum variance standard in section 18.050, as adding to the southwest corner would encroach deeper into the setback due to the diagonal rear property line. Um, addressing the uh, side of the house, um, while there is some area within the setback to the side of the home, there's a number of factors why that's not suitable. Um, our home was originally constructed in a split level design and it's built into the slope of the lot. So the lower level of the existing home is about three quarters underground until you get to the rear of the house. So in order to build on the side of the house, um, significant and frankly unnecessary excavation would need to be performed to expand the house there. Um, also, as I just mentioned, if you look at the images in attachment B on page nine, uh, Glen Oaks Drive and our lot are quite steeply so sloped. So we would need to do significant regrading likely um, of really the entire property below the side of the house um, in order to seat any new foundation there. Um, we'd also need to demolish at least six to eight healthy adult trees, uh, maybe as many as 20 in this process um, that would be interfering with that as a construction site. Um, also, our house is built in 1963 and it's in a custom long brick that we've been advised would be difficult to match. Um, and the only area of the house that uh, is already using building materials that we could reasonably match is again in the northwest corner where there's already uh, an aluminum siding being used. Um, how do I know that this makes the, this area uh, unreasonable to consider to be buildable? Uh, the purpose statement from the FR3 zoning ordinances, which reads, 
the purpose of the FR3 Foothill Residential District is to promote environmentally sensitive and visually compatible development of lots not less than 12,000 square feet in size. Suitable for Foothills locations as indicated in the applicable community master plan. The district is intended to minimize flooding, erosion, and other environmental hazards, to protect the natural scenic character of the Foothills area by limiting development, to promote the safety and well being of present and future residents of the Foothills areas, to protect wildlife habitat, and to ensure the efficient expenditure of public funds. So, while it wouldn't infringe upon a setback, adding to the southern side of the home, as suggested in the Planning Division staff report, clearly violates the intent and purpose of the FR3 ordinances. It wouldn't be visually compatible with the existing home or layout of the property. It would harm the natural scenic characters of the Foothills area. It would harm wildlife habitat and increase erosion by re the removal of a number of healthy trees. The amount of destruction required to build on the southern side of the home, frankly, disqualifies it from being considered an improvement in my mind. Contrarily, while our intended building location requires a variance to encroach into the setback, it's the only site that adds meaningful space to our home without violating any of the purposes of the FR3 ordinances, seeking to minimize disruption to land and neighborhood. Moving on to the second standard, um, which reads, there are special circumstances attached to the property that do not generally apply to other properties in the same zoning district. We've provided strong visual and numerical evidence demonstrating that there are special circumstances on our property. Because of the acute angled corner of Glen Oaks Drive and Scenic Drive, as shown in Exhibit A on page 27, our property shares a rear property line with a neighbor on Scenic Drive rather than extending. Mr. Miller, over. let me just yeah. interrupt you for a minute. Are you aware your camera's not on? I couldn't find how to turn. Oh, here it came up now. I'm not aware that it's not. Okay, on. I just didn't know if you were like showing exhibits and thinking that we could see them. No, uh, if you have the doc, I assumed you had the document. Yes. And like you said, yes. you, you've gone through it, so I'm just referencing um, okay. points of interest. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we share a property line, a rear property line with a neighbor on scenic drive, rather than extending all the way back to me Commonwealth Avenue, like all the other interior lots on our side of the street. Significantly reduces our front to back lot dimension compared to the typical shape and size properties in FR3. Just how much more limited our lot is in that front to back depth is supported by the data set I provided in exhibit B on pages 28 and 29. Out of the surrounding 54 parcels in our immediate neighborhood, ours is the fifth shortest, putting it in the 92nd percentile of shortness. This means that more than nine out of 10 other properties are longer than ours. It is 25 feet under the median property depth and 28 feet below the mean property depth. These are, of course, measures of average. And the fact that they're close together here means that the data is relatively normally distributed around that average. It's also more than a full standard deviation below that average depth of other homes in the neighborhood. And it's the shortest property depth of any on our street. Uh, standard deviation is a measure of how far away an average is from a particular, th that a particular sample is. In this case, sample is our lot. A sample with any standard deviation would be considered normal or close to average. A sample that's outside of a standard deviation like ours cannot be. This data inarguably demonstrates in objective terms that our property is on the extreme for lot shape and size in our neighborhood, and that this condition does not generally apply to the area as a whole. I also want to note from this data and the accompanying visual exhibit on page 31 that the 35 foot rear yard setback is a reasonable and sensible ordinance for typical properties in FR3. Most parcels in the zone have been divided, so they have large areas of land expanding back from the street. Having 25 feet less depth than what is typical for the neighborhood means that our house would have to be set 25 feet closer to the street in order for us to have a normal rear yard. In other words, the front of our home would need to be in the sidewalk. Given the large disparity that we're talking about here, 25 to 28 feet in depth dimension, we believe it's very reasonable to request a variance for only six and a half feet of construction. This is, in essence, why the variance process exists. An ordinance was created that is appropriate for the vast majority of properties in our zone, and it's just and reasonable for an exception to be made for properties like ours that did not match those general conditions when the ordinances were created. Moving on to the third standard, which reads, granting the variance is essential to the enjoyment of a substantial property right possessed by other properties in the same district. 
Making additions and improvement to our private property is a substantial property right in the state of Utah. When I asked the planning division to define what qualified as a substantial property right, they informed me that this was Utah state terminology and they were unable to provide any specific definition. Therefore, I contacted the state ombudsman, Richard Plen, to get confirmation that the type of addition we were proposing would qualify as a substantial property right. After briefly explaining our situation, his response was, quote, the elements for variances are provided by state code, so all local ordinances mirror the state's language. As for substantial property rights, the right to develop and install improvements on your property is a quintessential property right. So if other properties in your neighborhood have a right to add to their homes, and the reason why you cannot do the same is some unique characteristic of your property, then what we've provided is perfect. So do you some, have in, in writing from the ombudsman? I do. I have an email uh, for, um, with that exact quote. Okay. Um, from, from that response, it's clear that we have a substantial property right to install a home addition if other properties in our neighborhood could make similar improvements. And the reason that we cannot is because of the unusual shape and size conditions of our lot that I've just described. Thus, we conduct an extensive analysis of the surrounding neighborhood, measuring rear yard setbacks to see how many of the properties in our area could accommodate a seven foot extension to the rear of their home without violating a rear yard setback ordinance. The results of this are shown in exhibit D on page 31. And as you can see, out of the surrounding 53 lots, only three others could not accommodate similar construction to what we're proposing. One of which at 2253 Bel Air only cannot because they've already expanded their home to the rear. Um, I've been informed that they didn't actually receive a variance, but rather a special exception for the setback violation that they have. The point still stands though. They can't, they can't commit a construction without um, violating the setback ordinance because they already have constructed an addition. All other lots than ours on Glen Oaks Drive can make an addition. And with just a quick glance at the overhead map of the neighborhood, it's obvious that these measurements were not even close in the vast majority of circumstances. This also again reinforces the conditions of our property are not general to the surrounding neighborhood. Everybody else can make this addition except for us. The planning division declined to define the term substantial property right when I asked them directly, deferring to the state. And the state has confirmed that a home addition is a substantial property right if other properties generally have the right to do so. Moving on to the fourth standard, which reads, the variance will not substantially affect the general plan of the city and will not be contrary to the public interest. We love the scenic Foothills neighborhood and the community of people that are our neighbors. And our intention is to continue to live in our home for a long time. Our project plan is designed to minimize impact on the natural environment and the surrounding properties by placing half of the footprint of the addition within the ex existing footprint of our home. This allows us to add meaningful usable space to our home while only utilizing 120 square feet of additional area. The addition is also designed around the architectural shape of the original home to minimize visual impact from surrounding properties. It doesn't change the overall shape of the home or alter views from any surrounding property in any meaningful way. And because we want to keep living in this community, it was important to us that our addition would not disturb our neighbors. And thus I spent time visiting surrounding homes to share our project plan, why we required the variance for construction, and how our situation met the standards for variance set forth in Title 21A. All the neighbors I visited were kind enough to sign the petition forms you can see in Exhibit E on pages 32 to 40, supporting not only the construction of our addition, but also the issuance of a variance to that effect. I also looked at the East Bench Master Plan and found substantial evidence that our project matches the intention of development plan for our area in that document. I provided a number of excerpts in our application that support our project, but generally speaking, it's clear from reading the master plan that the intention is to allow sensible, reasonable development that maintains the character of the neighborhood and encourages neighborhood stability and aging in place, all of which are goals emb embodied in our construction plan. Our project uses minimal additional space, preserves the character of the Foothills neighborhood, both environmentally and architecturally, and makes it easier for us to remain as members of the community long term. Last, the fifth standard reads, the spirit of the title is observed and substantial justice is done. The purpose of the building ordinances is to shape a neighborhood's development in a specific way. Returning to the purpose statement for the FR3 zone, one can easily assess the development goals for our neighborhood preserving the synthesis of urban living with the natural environment, maintaining the slope land of the foothills by minimizing flooding and erosion, 
promoting the well being of the environment, wildlife, and residents with open natural spaces between homes. We've already discussed the minimal additional footprint required for our addition, but the irregular trapezoidal shape of our lot further allows us to maintain a yard area around the northwest corner, vastly in excess of the minimum standard required by the setback ordinances. This is shown in Exhibit C on page 30. While the ordinances are written in terms of distances, the side setback distance and rear setback distance together imply an area of yard that should be maintained in two dimensions. If our lot was a regular rectangular parcel, our addition would require 1,155 square feet of yard area around the building site to not encroach on the setbacks. Our actual property would maintain 1,826 square feet of yard area around an addition, nearly 60% more than what the ordinances imply. Now, while there's admittedly some mathematical convolution in converting the setback distances into an implied yard area, the fifth standard here speaks to the spirit of the title, not the literal reading. The purpose of the setback ordinances is to maintain robust outdoor spaces between homes, and Exhibit C clearly demonstrates that space will be well maintained in the spirit of the title, regardless of the encroachment into the literal setback. It also illustrates why there have been no complaints and only support for our project from the, sur the surrounding neighbors that would potentially be affected by it. The shape of our lot, the minimal additional footprint, the extensive yard area that will still exist all add up to a project that is in the spirit of limited development and the citizens that we most affected by it agree that it is re a reasonable request for variance that does not perceivably encroach on their rights or living space. Beyond those five items, which are the general standards um, provided in Title 21A, uh, Section 18.060 continues on to provide some additional guidelines further defining when the issuance of a variance would be appropriate that I want to briefly address. I've already thoroughly detailed the circumstances peculiar to, peculiar to our property and how they are responsible for the hardship. So I'm going to skip those sections, but I do want to talk about the self-imposed hardship section. The planning division staff report attempts to make an argument that our limitations in construction area are self-imposed, but to do so entirely ignores the words and spirit of Title 21A and the purpose statement for zone FR3 in particular. While there is alternative buildable area in theory that the staff report suggests would not violate the setback ordinances, it would undeniably harm the scenic character of Glen Oaks Drive from both an environmental and architectural standpoint. It would harm rather than protect wildlife habitat, increase erosion, and at a minimum would have an unknown effect on flooding patterns. When we began planning for our home addition, we weren't aware of the language in Title 21A specifically. The fact that our construction plan sought to minimize impact on the natural environment and visual character of our property and neighborhood was simply a product of good common sense citizenship as part of a community. Our hardship can only be considered self-imposed as far as it is a choice to be good citizens interested in the sensible development goals defined by Title 21A and the East Bench Master Plan. We wish to remain in good standing with our community. To close, I'd like to point out that there have been no complaints, no objections, no concerns or questions at all about our project from the other citizens surrounding us in FR3. In fact, there's been an overt show of support and approval for our construction, as I've already shared. One thing that's I don't think is in question is that our proposed construction is extremely modest, respects the natural environment and the original architectural intent of our home, utilizes a minimal amount of additional space, and only moves the exterior wall of the house six and a half feet. Outside of our inability to meet the rear yard setback due to the shape and size constraints of our lot, the proposed construction completely embodies the spirit of sensible limited development described in both the purpose statement for FR3 and the East Bench Master Plan. We still have the burden of proof as the applicants to show that we meet the criteria set forth in Title 21A in order to obtain a variance, but I believe I've just shown that we explicitly meet those standards. Fortunately for our application, a supportive planning division recommendation is not a required standard that allows you, the hearing officer, to issue a variance. So given that our application shows that we do meet the standards which are required, we respectfully request that you ignore the staff report's recommendation and approve our variance request. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Okay, we will now hear from Salt Lake City. Hi, good evening. So I'll skip some of the introductory um, of what the request is since Mr. Miller covered that very well. So the property is probably 70 87 feet in width and has an average depth of 111 feet, as Mr. Miller mentioned, creating a lot that is approximately 11,601 square feet in size. 
The minimum lot width in the FR3 zoning district is 80 feet and the lot size is 12,000 square feet. So the property is seven feet wider than the requirement and just slightly below the required lot area. And as described in the staff report, the lot is a legal lot that was created through the subdivision process and currently contains a single family home. So as discussed in the staff report, the subject property does have an irre irregular shape, but staff is of the opinion that the irre irregular shape is not unusual for the FR3 zoning district. Staff also acknowledges that the lot does have a shallow depth compared to others in the neighborhood, but it also has a wider lot width than required by the zone and of those on the block face in the neighborhood, which gives the property a similar buildable area and does not limit the potential of an addition to the front or side of the structure. Staff is of the opinion that the property does not have a hardship related to size, shape, or topography. As for the question on the substantial property right, I believe those conversations on the definition um, were early in the process and before the staff report was researched or published. Um, after conversations internally with staff, um, we came to the conclusion that because of its elite plot, um, the ability to construct a single family dwelling on the property is a substantial property right. And while the desire for the addition is understandable, staff does not believe that having an addition is a substantial property right. The requested variance is not due to unique characteristics of the property, but it's a penny of the staff that it's rather self-imposed hardship of wanting more space. And so in my brief comments, this um, based on the information the staff report, it's planning staff's opinion that the requested variance for the reduction of the 35 foot setback does not meet this, all of the standards of approval and recommends that the hearing officer deny the variance request. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, do we have anyone in the public who wishes to speak on this matter? Uh, we have Nathan Pace is raising his hand. I will uh, unmute him and allow him. Okay, and you have public comment is limited to two minutes. Go ahead, Mr. Pace. Uh, on, page, on page 10, it shows the rear facing. Oh, first of all, my name is Nathan Pace, 112211 CD Drive, which is the our backyard, <laughs> the backyard of the property. And my wife, in fact, did sign a, a petition saying that uh, we agreed with the requested variance. Uh, in seeing the plan of the document provided by the uh, planning officer, I was struck by the appearance of the addition with vertical medical corrugated, which seems to be quite uh, different from the general architectural design of the house, which is a brick facade uh, mostly. Uh, so I agree with my wife that I don't see this would really cause difficulty in our yard, but I am a little distressed that the, uh, the aesthetics of the facade that would be on this addition, and I don't know if that is used in making decisions or not. So, but in terms of the actual size and the fact it goes a little bit closer to the property line, doesn't really concern me. It's more of the question of aesthetics, but I don't know if that is relevant. Thank you. I appreciate your coming to comment. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Newell. I'll ask if he, Mr. Mo Newell, would you like to comment? I don't have any comments. Thank you. And one other, um, uh, Mr. Thur, would you like to comment? Jeffrey Thur, would you like to comment? I'm getting no response at this point. Okay. Okay. I guess I will go ahead and close the public hearing seeing that there are no further people who wish to comment and I will bring it back to the applicant. Um, Mr. Miller, um, you can go ahead. Um, I just wanted to respond to Mr. Pace. Um, thank you for attending Mr. Pace. Um, uh, so the uh, drawings that you were looking at with the vertical siding, um, we had not gotten to the point where we had uh, made any, you know, final decisions on uh, specific building materials. Um, 
So if, if this does get approved um, to, to move forward to build, I, I'm happy to consult with you to make sure you're, you're the people who will be looking at this, um, you know, directly the most. So I'm happy to consult with you to make sure that the facade that you would have from the view from your property, um, you know, looks agreeable uh, to, to you. Um, that being said, um, if you look out um, from your rear yard, the spot where we're trying to build, which would be from your view, the leftmost side of our house does already have aluminum siding on that portion. Um, it's a, the, the, you are correct. The rest of the house is done in a, in a, in a brick facade, but we have a, it's a it's kind of dark green, gray aluminum siding, um, over, um, that wall of the house. That's specifically where we're looking to expand. That's why the. Diagrams that we drew up had a, a similar material there, but like I said, um, if, if this gets approved and we end up constructing, I'm happy to consult with you to make sure that it's visually appropriate for from your view. Okay, anything else? Okay. I don't have anything else. Okay, is there anything else the city would like to add? Um, I did want to address one point that Mr. Miller made about the significant excavation and um, grading. That while that is not ideal on the south side, um, that's also related to economics and also design preferences for the style of the home, and um, which is more economic related and not permissible in a variance case. So thank you. Well, I, I would like to respond to that. That's um, fine. I, I I can afford to regrade it. Um, that's not an economic issue. Uh, I don't want to regrade it because we like the natural environment around our house. Our house, when we bought it, one of the reasons why we bought it was because we have uh, a number of beautiful oak trees around our yard. And I, like I said, we read it, reading the purposes of the ordinances it's to respect the natural environment, not to destroy the foothills area. Um, and frankly, our home and our neighbor's home and several other houses in the neighborhood were all designed by the same architect. So I'm uninterested in building this tumor out of the side of our house um, to destroy the architectural facade of our home. It has nothing to do with an economic problem. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's nothing else, I'm going to go ahead and close this hearing. I will take the matter under advisement and issue a written decision in the next two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any final matters, Joel? Uh, no, we don't. Thank you okay. for your Thank you. So with that, uh, we're done with business and we will stop the recording. All right. The meeting is concluded. Thank you very much. Thanks.